if you actually look at what's been achieved, you know, going back 30 years to now in emissions from heavy duty truck engines and trucks, well I say engines but you need to think of it as a system now with all the after treatment uh, side of it as well. The achievement is frankly phenomenal. It's been um, mainly an engineering achievement in terms of you know higher pressure injection, different flow patterns in, you know, lots and lots of engineering technology there, a huge amount of progress on the after treatment side with diesel particulate filters, um, the uh, SCR systems, etc., um, enabled by better fuels. You know, the fuel sulfur has come down globally um, in most markets, um, and enabled by better lubricants as well. But that has been quite a stunning achievement in terms of that. However, it's never enough. Um, and what we learn now, of course, is that perhaps the the local emissions in terms of the NOx and the particulates, the achievements have been made there. But the game has changed now with the recognition around greenhouse gases and the CO2. So I think the drive is got to keep all those gains in terms of local emissions, but have got to focus far more on the efficiency side and therefore the CO2 emissions mm -hmm. from the diesel. Mm -hmm. Having said that, the vista we see is that the diesel engine for heavy duty transport is going to be the major solution for a considerable period of time. I can't really speculate how long that will be. Many people do, but mm. you know, forecasting is a is a dangerous game. But it's going to be uh, significant. There will be um, areas that will go into uh, advanced technologies like like gas, hydrogen, or electric quicker, particularly the light commercial vehicles, final mile delivery, and things like that. But for the on road trucking because of the energy density of diesel and the efficiency of the system, we see that the diesel engine has quite a long life in that respect. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so, you know, hydrogen, you know, obviously, you know, Shell's had penetration yep. in that market. Yep. So what's what's the outlook like? I mean, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think hydrogen is one of the more promising uh, alternatives for well, for, for cars in certain places as well, but for, for also trucking, but it's it's quite a long way to go um, in that side. So I think it will be part of the, what we call this mosaic of solutions. Um, in some places it will be economically advantaged. It will penetrate to a certain extent. We also think the gas side will penetrate, penetrate more, but there'll still be a major role for diesel engines for a good long period of time. Mm -hmm. Okay, so lower viscosity oils, um, yep. so you've had good success, so can you tell me more about the CK4, FA4? Yeah, I mean we, we've actually been looking at low viscosity oils for quite some time. Um, you know, if you go back, we, I think we were the first company to introduce a 5W30 premium um, uh, heavy duty engine oil in Europe, and that was a couple of decades ago now so you know there's always been that interest but that was constrained by this parameter that probably Jason explained to you called the high temperature high shear viscosity which is a kind of complex um, measure but is, is one of the more fundamental measures that the engine really understands um, in that sense so now what we're moving to with the FA4 oils and equivalents in, in other parts of the world is removing that barrier um, and going down and down and yeah so we've had some good success there I think it's still fair to say the market there's there's much more potential in the market than we have achieved so far so we've got to get better at uh, telling the story and convincing people that you know their engine's not gonna uh, wear out really quickly or something because they've moved to a thinner lubricant and they can get the benefit um, from it one of the challenges I think just on the sideline is just how we persuade people that there is a benefit there even if it's rather small for them to measure on a day-to-day -day basis given that the, you know, the driver or the tyres or the weather can mask that, that, uh, that effect, but it's there. So what role does the OEM have to play in, in that? Because obviously they're going to have you know, some concerns when a new lubricant comes out, but yep. obviously this is a proven uh, formula or formulas. Yep. So have, have they stepped up enough then in terms of educating uh, fleet owners? Well, yeah, it's, it's, it's got to be a system. Uh, we've all got to play um, our role in that. And um, I think there's not a simple answer to that because I think different OEMs uh, have different um, uh, responses in that situation. So some have been more uh, progressive in that front. Some older engines cannot deal with the, the thinner uh, viscosity. That's 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 in particular that's the FA4. Yeah, the FA4 type type lubricants. They can't deal with it. So you know maybe you have to then have more complex guidelines that say certain engines can cope, so certain engines can't. But I think what we should really be doing is those engines that can cope really should 
be driven to that that kind of uh, um, lubricant a for the economic benefit and b for the emissions benefit are, are they advancing engine technology enough to to, to keep pace with yeah. lubricant uh, development um i think it's more a um uh, you know, to so keep pace with lubricant, it's, 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 it is. <laughs> you know, there's no point in me designing a loop, my team designing a lubricant that um, only works in one engine. You know, yeah. there's yeah. In the end of the day, that's not going to be a sustainable uh, business. So we have to work together in 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 these uh, fronts. Obviously, different OEMs will be at different stages in developments, different readiness. I think the legislative drive, and you see it with the latest you know, European uh, legislation, is really going to push this now. I mean, it's mm. just, uh, for, for years, I think the legislation has really rely, relied on the fact that trucking industry is highly competitive and fuel cost is a, mm. is a driver of that competitiveness. So therefore, the engines have become generally more efficient um, mm. over time. Um, with a few retrograde steps when the emissions legislation has driven technology in, in the in the other uh, direction. Now, I think the legislators, you know, given um, the the, uh, the opinions on climate change, etc., are just going to force that pace at a much higher rate. Mm. Been doing it for cars for years, mm. but it's a lot harder in, in the world of trucks and, and heavy duty, especially when you think of all the different ways that a heavy duty engine is used, mm. um, to have that legislation. But I think the time for sort of uh, difficulty stating is probably gone, and the time now is to, to drive that. You've had some legislation like that in the US for quite some time, of course, mm. um, but, but not here. Mm. Not no. here, not in the same way. Yep. Um, Okay, so partnering. So it's interesting, right? You know, obviously Shell, a very large company, and a lot of different paths you can you can take. And you know, in terms of uh, auto development, right? Lubricants, coolants. Have have you partnered up with any major you know EV companies at this point? You know, I'm thinking you know Tesla, Nikola. No. Yeah. Any. Right. Yeah. Um, Yes, uh, but more, I would say, the component suppliers than the, the final vehicle manufacturers. I think it's a very interesting thing going on in the EV space, I'm thinking cars more at the moment, is that you know, who's going to be the winners uh, going forward? You know, um, uh, how can I put this? The, 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 you know, the, if you take, um, I probably better not name names, but if you take a, a, you know, a big OEM, they've typically kept the engine manufacturing in-house most of the time. Maybe not the transmissions, mm. but often the engine is in house, or they have a swap deal with a with a partner, the Ford, Peugeot, diesel engines, yeah, things like that. Mm. Um, but now it's a completely different uh, game. You need an electrical system with a power pack and a battery system and and alternate inverters and and things like that. So the the people who were strong in that are not necessarily the right competencies going forward. So now you see a lot of new entrants come into the space that that might not have had such a uh, presence in the auto industry and picking, picking the winners um, in this kind of field, knowing who's going to survive um, and thrive in this field is, uh, I don't know that anybody knows at the moment. Mm -hmm. So we're working with a couple of companies that we've never worked with before because they're, they're um, for example, in the battery technology space, they're looking to do you know, new things with batteries to enable fast charging, for example. Mm -hmm. We would never have spoken to these guys before, um, but, but the, the game is changing. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have a number of partnerships. Um, we are we are suppliers of uh, e-fluids to a number of companies, but the, the the deals that we do don't allow us to talk about those mm -hmm. uh, in the public space. We are involved in Formula E racing, for example, to you know to drive things forward um, on that side. Um, so yeah, we're 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 definitely there, and we're definitely partnering with people. But at the moment, they're mainly um, sort of backroom deals, so to speak, in terms of you can't really talk about them in the public space yet. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, it's interesting because a lot of our fleet managers, fleet owners, you know, are looking at truck electrification yep. and considering, you know, the, the possibilities there. Still, obviously, a lot of, you know, challenges there. Yeah. Uh, what's what Shell's outlook say, you know, heavy duty electrification? What's your take on it? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's going to come, um, it, you know, from our overall um, supply position. Uh, the, the most interest is in the cars at the moment because that's where the, the things are moving fastest. Yeah. But from a truck side, it's coming. We've got, to be, we've got to be there. We've got to stay relevant in that space. So we've got to be part of it. Again, that's not necessarily working with a truck manufacturer, but it could be working with the, 
you know, the e-axle supplier or some, something like that, you know, an Eaton, for example, you know, uh, makes, uh, you know, technology in that space. Um, so um, I believe it's coming. I think the pace of it will be not the same as the pace um, in the light duty space. And therefore, from a, sustain, uh, from a business sustainability position, we have to get the, the car side Mm. working really fast mm. which we have which we have been doing and but we're increasingly working on the heavy duty side as well so it's interesting uh, you know I'm thinking okay the uh, plastics uh, for instance um, it seems like there's an opportunity there for for shell petroleum based uh, yeah. products oh, know, which we do composites yeah. Yeah. Plastics, we do that already yeah. uh, for aero uh, for instance aero applications yeah. um, is that is that growing are there more opportunities yeah. potentially yeah. It, there is that? I'll give you one example that I mean you you asked the question the other day and I didn't really uh, dive into it but um, a lithium battery has an anode and a cathode like any battery and has a separator mm. between them. The separator is a sort of plastic film. The plastic film relies on, on having um, porosity in it. You achieve that. Our, one of our products is used in the production of that plastic film to get, okay. the, to get the porosity in there. So, mm. you know, right back into the fundamentals of the lithium battery, we're in there mm. uh, in that sense, you know. So, you know, we've got lots of different elements where shell is in the car so to speak mm. not to mention of course the supply chain of getting the lithium from a mine in bolivia all the way to the factory in china to the consumer in germany or something you know mm. there's all of that side of it as well but actually intrinsic to the battery we're already involved in that part of the chain um, the next development where we see uh, which is really interesting to us is um, and bob tried to uh, cover it today is if you look at how a tesla cools the battery, uh, they use these copper pipes passing through with a, a standard glycol based coolant, you know, the Rotella Extended Life coolant would work fine in that space. Um, many of the chi Chinese OEMs use air cooling um, or similar systems. Increasingly people are looking at can you take the battery and radically cool it by immersing it in a fluid? Mm -hmm. And so we're working that technology very hard mm -hmm. at the moment, you know, because then you can probably achieve the fast charging, you know, the 10 minutes to charge your car or something, which is a bit of the sort of holy grail for these things. Mm -hmm. yep. um, to replicate the functionality that you have with a, with a typical gasoline car. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so before, a couple of years back, you had mentioned that fleets a lot of times when they want to cut costs, unfortunately will, will hit oil first. What are some of the pitfalls uh, for, for doing some, something like that? Yeah, you know, I, I mean, the first thing is probably you're not taking advantage of the most fuel efficient oil. If you just go for cost, then you're probably going to push yourself towards the, the standard grades, the 1540s, 1040s, whatever, and you're not getting the fuel economy uh, benefit of that. You may find that difficult to measure, so you may not appreciate it, but that's the pitfall. Mm. Secondly, of course, then if you want to go for extended drain interval and cut your maintenance costs, you probably want to have a better oil um, in that sense. Mm. So you're probably having a false economy. The third one, depending, you know, I'm not going to castigate our competitors' products, but if you don't get it right, then you've probably got a reliability issue as well in that sense at a certain stage. Again, maybe not on day one, maybe not on day five, but sometime out in the future. So, you know, all of these things um, can be improved by a better choice of lubricant. Mm. Real-time oil analysis, yep. and my last question. Um, could that potentially prove to be really beneficial yeah. for some fleets that are kind of you know yeah. on the edge, not really quite embracing? That's a, that's a game changer. If you talk about the Internet of Things and the uh, sensor technology and all of that, then real-time oil analysis, as opposed to what we offer now, which is you know, take a sample, send it away to our laboratory, which is a great service and you get a lot of insights, and, and the uptake of that could be much higher. But real-time, in terms of trying to get a health check for the oil as an indicator of what the machine is telling you, that is is yeah that's really interesting that's actually very difficult <laughs> and we and we and others are working on that that kind of thing because again if you think of the the big data and internet of things if you could sense you know the, the, there's something going on in my engine now mm. you know that would be uh, fabulous mm. but to do that in a in a cost effective way we can do that you know we can but at the moment i would say the sensor is probably not at a level where um, a fleet operator would would afford it at this moment mm. if you've got a big engine or, you know a big varsilla or something fine um, but in a cost challenge world that's probably not quite there yet but it's going to come 